I'm Dr. J.J. Hurtak, and I'm here with my wife, Desiree Hurtak, also a doctor of environmental science. In 2007, we were speakers at the World Summit on climate change and also a special session dealing with water, a precious commodity, and the importance that we as a global community must take in preserving these precious water resources. We know, for example, that 17% of the deaths of diarrhea can be traced to water pollution. 19% of deaths of pneumonia also to water pollution and 7 to 8% of malaria to water pollution. So we have a global situation that requires countermeasures and we've been able to work on this through a whole new process of activating favorable microbial life forms to eat as it were the products of pollution. We've been also able to work with educators throughout the world, particularly in the developing countries, where we are able to dialogue with them so they become the water keepers of their respective estuaries, aquifers, and water areas that are so precious for the future generation. But more than that, Desiree and I were shocked when we realized at the World Summit that we have only a short period of time, perhaps as small as a decade, to take responsibility to control the greenhouse gases, the CO2 emissions and other pollutants that are pushing us more towards the precipice of destruction. And yet in this wonderful part of Central Europe, we see the responsibility of preserving what we will call the natural eco communities that have taken on a solidarity of bringing small businessmen, farmers, educators together to work with the NGOs, the non-government organizations, to take, as it were, the environmental issue forward. So I'm going to turn now the conversation over to Desiree. Desiree, give us an overview of where we're going from this point forward. Well, we're sitting here in the middle of a pristine environment, probably one of the most beautiful in the world. But in reality, water and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide are tied together. Most people don't realize that. That the idea that water absorbs the mass of carbon in our planet and it's going into the waters very much like a Coke bottle. You know, what makes Coke fuzzy is actually carbonated substance and this is exactly what's happening to our oceans and this carbonation is not only killing the fish life because they can't live in the high acidity that is created by this but it's also destroying the um, coral now some coral you, you see these beautiful coral reefs in uh, Australia and also off the coast of Florida and you don't realize how they got there they're actually living organisms that grow very, very slowly. Some coral reefs are as much as a million years old and they're being destroyed at this time just simply by the acidity of the water caused by the carbon. So we really have to do something for the planet. We have to get nature back to what we're seeing here today, something very beautiful, something very natural without the pollutants. I recently read an article, I don't know, I wasn't one there, but they said there was one place where the water was so polluted that it actually ate a shirt, which means you put the shirt in the water and it actually is destroyed. We've seen this with canals, even in areas like Egypt and Africa, where it's so polluted that you probably would have to just bury the canals. You couldn't actually clean the canals because you would be overwhelmed by the toxins. So let's get nature back to where it started. And then we can live in a greater harmony and a greater balance. We can be healthier because we're all connected. And I love my favorite saying, you dump it, you drink it. Because no matter what you dump, at some point it comes back to you, whether it's medicines, whether it's detergents, whatever. So let's look at this nature and really appreciate what we can have and we can help reestablish. Now you're also an environmental specialist in terms of the strategies being used by the governments of Europe to tackle some of these problems dealing with the environment. 
or what some journalists would call Umwelt oder Waffen, either a military industrial economy or that which is green or towards the environment. How do you perceive Europe is ahead of the rest of the world in dealing with the grassroots environmental countermeasures and solutions that are necessary? Well, obviously the people here are very educated and very conscious. You go to places like Brazil, which we've traveled to many times, and people don't realize when they cut down trees what they're really doing. People don't realize when they throw things into the water, they think it's just going to be going away. There's a lack of education. People in Europe are educated, they're conscious, they actually see things. Um, well, they, how do, but the NGOs, what uh, role do they play in this overall picture strategy? Well, the good thing with the NGOs is they're able to come from the education they have here and take this to third world countries. So they're able to clean up areas. In fact, we have pictures of these soap suds in the middle of Colombia and Peru. Just because people are washing their clothes in the river, they don't realize that downstream there's all this pollution that they're creating. So the NGOs are able to you know, come in, educate the people, and make a difference. Could you say in terms of the solidarity of the European movements more towards green solutions, that the governments are more willing to listen now to the NGOs, the non-government organizations, as opposed to political parties? Well, certainly the fortunate thing about Europe is the Green Party and also the fact that many of the NGOs, such as Greenpeace and the World Wild Fund for Nature, are all having a say in the European uh, Union, specifically the European Parliament, but in some cases with the European Commission. So they're listening to these groups, probably more than they're listening anywhere else in the world. So I have to give a credit for the European Union for being able to bring that about. And this is important also that we increase this dialogue of H2O worldwide so that every part of the world, no matter what the situation, becomes part of the global message that we can make or break as it were the next stage of human evolution if we do not take responsibilities as being the water keepers of our respective backyard. So the old motto, not in my backyard, has to be changed. We must have a global vision and also a responsibility of being water keepers and water caretakers and water transformationalists, if I may coin that word, in our part of the world fabric. So let's go take a look at what we have here, how pristine this area is.